Hey guys, it's Jamie. And I'm Amanda, and we're with Siouxland Libraries. And today we are going behind the scenes at the Butterfly House and Aquarium. Let's go check it out. It's gonna be awesome. Hey guys, we are here with Colton, who is a biologist here at the Butterfly House. And Colton, you're gonna bring us into a very special room called the containment room, right? Yes, so I'm gonna bring you into containment and I'm going to show you the E window or the emergence window. This is where we keep all of our chrysalis and cocoons for our moths and butterflies. Uh, it's a special part of the room where we keep the temperature and the humidity really high to allow the butterflies to finish up that transformation process inside of their chrysalis and then emerge as the wonderful butterflies and moths that we know. That is awesome. How long does that process take for them to kind of be in their chrysalis and then before they can emerge? Um, so it's really, really dependent on the species. There are some species like um, luna moths or uh, cecropia moths they're bigger moth types. They can spend basically up to nine months inside of it. They overwinter inside of their oh, chrysalis. Wow. Um, but a lot of the time, it takes maybe about 10 days for them to go through that whole process. That's much more the average, like a week or two. Very cool. Do you have to do anything special for the butterflies when they're in this stage? Um, so the most important thing is we need to keep their temperature in a very specific range. So they need to be between around like 75 to around 85 degrees, much hotter, and it starts to do some real damage to them. And if they're much colder, they don't actually go through the process. It slows it down and it actually kind of stops it. Uh, and then it also needs to have a really high humidity. So these are mostly tropical species, so they need to be sitting at a humidity somewhere around 70%. If they're much higher, they start to get, uh, it starts to do some damage and things like mold can grow. Uh, if it gets much lower, they're not going through the process. It's similar to with uh, when it gets too cold, it slows down the process, it breaks it down and they aren't able to survive as well. Wow, so there is a lot that goes into this. Yes. But you don't have to feed them or anything. I can't imagine going a week without food, let alone nine months. How do these guys last that long? Um, so when they're at the caterpillar stage, they're eating a whole bunch of food. That's essentially all a caterpillar does with its day. It eats food, it sleeps, and then it goes to the bathroom. It does those three things, it does nothing else. Uh, and it gets all nice, fat, and pudgy, and it will survive, mo quite a number of the species will survive completely off of the food they eat as a caterpillar. So most moths never eat as adults. They turn into the cocoon, they emerge in the cocoon, turn into adult, live their entire adult lifespan, and they'll never eat. Um, but the vast majority of the time, they've just stored up like a whole bunch of like fat reserves and nice reserves for themselves. Kind of like when a bear goes into hibernation, they're doing oh, okay. that same process. They build up a nice reserve, they grow through the process, they emerge, and then the first thing they want to do is get some nectar if they're a butterfly. Very cool. So if they want to get some nectar, where would they find that nectar? Uh, so as soon as we get them out of the E window, we'll put them out into our conservatory. In the wild, they're going to find nectar from like nice sources of uh, nice big bunches of flowers. They're also going to do some other cool stuff like they'll drink pond water or puddles. They really want the salts. And then some cool ones will even like land on alligator or crocodiles. They'll mess with their eyes and they'll drink the tears. I can't, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, uh, so there's several species that really want to eat the salts that the tears of the crocodiles produce. It's actually a really high source of energy for them. Colton, that was the coolest thing I've probably <laughs> ever learned about butterflies. <laughs> Very cool. So we're here with Janae. She's a biologist at the Butterfly House and she's gonna tell us about the conservatory space that we're in. So yeah, tell me a little bit about what you do here. Yeah, so we have a very special environment where we keep tropical butterflies, tropical and um, other plants, and we like to keep it very full. So we order in from our suppliers about 300 to 500 chrysalis per week and we like to keep 800 to 1,000 flying at all times. That is crazy. I mean, I'm looking around and I'm seeing a ton of butterflies. So yeah. how many different types do you think you have? Yeah, so I would say it ranges from about 30 to 60 species, 
depending on the time of year. So do you have a favorite species that you work with or one that you think is uh, really interesting looking? Yeah, so I always joke that it changes on the week. <laughs> um, so my first week, I would say the leopard lacewing was my favorite. That sounds cool. But it definitely changed and it goes from the glass wing, which is a very rare one that we got in a couple weeks ago, okay. um, to right now we just got in Luna Moth uh, cocoons. And so that is my, my favorite right now. You can see I'm repping it right oh. here. <laughs> so um, otherwise, as far as natives go, I do really love monarch butterflies. Yeah, we do beautiful. not keep any natives here. Okay. So how long do they live? Unfortunately, they have a very short lifespan. So the typical butterfly is going to live two to four weeks okay. with the, the rare exception of up to six weeks. You know, if I'm a kid that's interested in learning more about butterflies or, you know, eventually doing this type of work, what, what can I do as a, somebody who's young looking to get involved? Yeah. So I would say start as a citizen scientist. Um, go to monarchwatch.org or Journey North is another great um, okay. resource. And check those out. Start with your own observations at home. Look at the plants around. Look at what plants attract butterflies and do kind of your own studies. Um, as far as when you get older, of course we want you to get out, volunteer. Right. Um, we want you to be an intern here. Four years ago, I interned as an aquarist. And now I'm oh. back for a position here, which is great. That's awesome. Um, so get active and really start educating yourself. That's cool. It's so good to know that you can get involved so young. And we've got a ton of resources at the library, which is speaking of, we always love to ask, what was your favorite book as a kid? My favorite book, I would have to say, is Oh, The Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. Yep, that's a good one. Definitely one of my faves, too. All right, we are here with Constance, and we are in the kitchen. And Constance is an aquarist here at the Butterfly House. And Constance, this is looking really complicated. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now? So right now I'm actually running our water chemistry testing for some of our exhibits. Uh, the test that I'm doing right now is testing the magnesium levels in one of our coral tanks. Uh, so we monitor our water chems pretty closely. This helps to make sure that we're maintaining appropriate animal health. Wow, and then what are the different colors mean in some of these vials? So all of these tests are actually finished tests. I've already run them and everything. Um, so each different test that we do has a different color in which it reads at to indicate its um, levels in the water. So these really pretty pink ones, these are pH tests. So each of our tanks is going to have a variant of the color pink depending on what its pH level is. Uh, these green ones are a alkalinity test. Uh, the alkalinity is the hardness of the water. These kind of light pink ones are nitrites. Uh, they are reading the nitrite in the water, which is part of the nitrogen cycle, as well as ammonia, which is this green color. Um, so pretty much what all these tests are doing is the color spectrum is going to indicate if the level's really high or if it's low, which for most of them, it is all in range. Woohoo! Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> That's good news. Yes, it's very good news. Well, very cool. We'll let you get back to work. We don't want to distract you too much. <laughs> uh, but thanks so much for showing us this. Yeah, thank you guys. So we're here in the aquarium. And this is an aquarist, Shannon. And she's going to kind of tell us about this space. So what, what do we all have in here? So we have about a little over 500 different species of animals in here, varying from fish invertebrates and stingrays. We have about 10 to 15 exhibits um, housing all different types of animals from all over the parts of the world. So yeah, I see clownfish, stingray, coral reefs back here. And what would you say your favorite thing is? My favorite has to be the cuttlefish. Um, they're really cool. So they're part of the cephalopod um, family. They uh, are also related to octopus and squid as oh. well, so they can color change, they can change the shape of their body. Wow. 
Wow. They're I really cool. Know. When we were looking at them, like you can tell they look like kind of a squid a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, and when they eat, like, ha like I see something like shooting out. It, what is that? So those are their feeder tentacles. Um, so they have eight arms and then they have those feeder tentacles that kind of are textured at the end so they can grab their food and bring it to their mouth. And they actually have beaks. Really? Where they hold they, all their arms, they hold the food and then their beak just kind of chews at their food. All right, so, and you have jellyfish here, which I love. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about those? So jellyfish are cool because they don't have a brain. They kind of just exist in the ocean. They pulse and then they eat. They kind of just run into their food. They're basically just like lobs of goo that kind of pulse into the ocean. Interesting. Um, they have great regenerative properties. So if they lose an arm or part of their bell, they can just kind of grow it back if it wasn't too damaged. And they can live a pretty long time. So in captivity, they live about a year, but nobody really knows the full extent of a lifespan of a jellyfish, so. You have stingrays. Yes. And you can actually touch the stingrays when mm -hmm. you're here. Yep. So what, I mean, what do they feel like? So they do have a mucus layer around them, okay. just like most fish do. Um, kind of protects them from bacteria and um, viruses and stuff. Um, so they'll be a little slimy and smooth. Okay, yeah. interesting. And their mouths are underneath them, right? Yes. And they, yeah. Okay, that's how they eat? So they just kind of suck up their food? Is yeah. that right? So, like, for example, our, our southern stingray, he is more of a benthic ray, which means he'll be more along the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so that's where their mouth is. And so they'll eat clams and shrimp, basically different types of crustaceans. And their jaw is very powerful. So they'll be able to crush the shell of a clam and then eat the meat out. Right. So don't... Don't shove your hand. Okay, yeah. okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Touch them on the top. Yep. All right. You know, if I'm interested in learning more about ocean creatures or possibly doing work like you do, what what, what can I do? Volunteer. So okay. literally, um, how I got started was doing volunteer um, volunteering and internships at facilities, pretty much anywhere, all across the country. Um, aquariums and zoos are always looking for volunteers to help either with education um, or with animals. So you can help with feeding, all that type of stuff. So that's how you gain that experience to eventually, hopefully work there yeah. if you really wanted to. That's awesome. It has just been an incredible experience here. I'm definitely gonna check out some of the fish. I just thank you so much for showing us around. Yeah, of course. So we're here with Archie. And this is actually the size he would have been in real life. He's huge. It's so big, it's so cool. The things that we've learned here at the Butterfly House has just been so amazing. And it's been so much fun to see the butterflies, the aquariums, I've just had a blast. It's really, truly been incredible. We have learned so much. And if you wanna learn more, we have books at the library. Come check them out, come say hi to us. And we'll see you next time, right? Bye. Bye.